All right. Okay, everyone. Uh, I am with Charlie from England. Hello. Hello, Charlie. And uh, we are in San Pedro at Lake Atitla in Guatemala. And uh, I met Charlie here through some uh, uh, um, common friends from England as well. And uh, I've had the pleasure of doing a day ride with Charlie. And uh, he's got some interesting stories and opinions, and as we all do. So we are going to hear those. So Charlie, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Cheers. Cheers. Excellent. We should. So probably we should probably drink. Yeah. So Charlie, first, uh, as always, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you end up here, starting from day one? Okay. So I was born on Thursday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I grew up in the UK. Um, went to school in the UK, um, yeah, I guess, uh, moved to London after university and, um, started working in town for about six, seven years. I, I guess I always kind of, uh, felt like the need to do bigger and bigger adventures each summer with my friends. So like bike tours around Europe or, you know, we're going to buy a car and, and drive it across Europe for 200 quid, or we're going to drive a car across the U S and I guess. I, uh, I hadn't really realized that a trip like this was something in my future um, until I kind of matured in my sense of adventure. That really happened when I moved to Canada, which is in 2018. Uh, just looking for broader horizons. I'm a big skier, biker, uh, like the outdoors, and a uh, bit of a vehicle enthusiast. So I, I moved out to Canada, uh, got a good friendship group out there had myself a nice four-wheel drive, got into camping and spending time in the mountains and stuff like that. And I guess motorcycles came along almost purely out of necessity. So I was always into mountain biking. I'd always enjoyed the idea of motorcycles, never really dabbled with that side of things, always been into cars. But purely the necessity to do a big trip like this, I just don't have the means to do that in a, in a car. It's a lot more expensive and when I learned the accessibility of a trip like this on a motorcycle, that's when I sort of started looking at it as an option. And so kind of the classic uh, mix some of us are under is we're, we're, we're motorheads in some way, be it cars yeah. or motorcycles. We love to travel, kind of chocolate, peanut butter, put them together. Yeah. And you've got motorcycle travel. Yeah. So that's where you ended up. Exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and how, uh, so you are on a round the world trip? Not around no. the world, no, okay. for, for now. Where did you start? Uh, I started in Whistler. So okay. I've, I've been living in Whistler since 2018. And I guess that was my starting point. And originally I planned to be in Ushuaia after about five or six months, <laughs> okay. which, was, which was incredibly naive. Zing. Um, I'm definitely someone who's in this trip for the mission, for the adventure, for the challenge, as opposed to, you know, I still do my fair share of sightseeing, but uh, I really just enjoyed the idea of having this hellish five or six months, like crossing from one side of the globe to the other. And it was only when I learned how many little dirt roads there were to explore along the way that I thought, okay, maybe there's a little bit more Slow adventure. Slow the roll. Yeah. Slow the roll. Right? So I'm, I'm lucky that I'm in a position to do that. And um, it looks like at the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause my trip in Colombia and I'm going to live there for six months until October. And then in October, I'm going to continue my trip to, so I make the weather window in Ushuaia. Oh, I was going to ask, is the pause for weather? The uh, pause is, it's a little bit of everything. Um, I don't want to like drain all my resources. I would like to work a little bit part-time remote in Colombia. Um, I'd like to experience uh, a different culture for an extended period of time, preferably somewhere that doesn't serve delicious little flat whites, you know, in a nice gentrified town. So I think Colombia would be a cool cultural experience. And as I've been diving a little bit more into the Spanish, I felt like it would be really beneficial to have an extended period of time where I'm speaking that language. And I, I don't know if I'll get an opportunity to do that again. So now is better than another time. Yeah, and I'd like to mention both Charlie and I are here in uh, San Pedro taking Spanish school as well. He's been here for three weeks. See, si. see, si. oh, <laughs> moving the end. Look at that. <laughs> we'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs> I uh, have only been here a week, but regardless, uh, yes, uh, stopping and working on your Spanish has its merits. And, and six months in Colombia is going to make you pretty much an expert. Definitely. I hope so. I hope so. Okay. So when did you start in BC again? Well, how started, long have you been on the road up till now? Yeah, so I started just before Halloween. I started on a full moon and there's this okay. cool thing, like whenever a full moon comes around, 
I've never been like uh, someone who's into, I guess, uh, you know, what's it called? Mystical. Yeah, I've never been like a yeah. moon cycle guy. I don't even know what it's called. But now, every time I see a full moon, I go, another month on the road, you know? <laughs> so it has become like a mystical experience right, for yeah. me. So I'm four moons into my trip. Okay. All right. Sound very Native American at well, this point, yes. I'm trying to integrate myself. Right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So four months <laughs> onto this trip. Four months into the trip, yeah. Excellent. And I'm anticipating to be in Colombia in about two months. Okay. A month of which will be um, Central America, and then I have a little uh, expedition planned for the Darien Gap. Ah, yes. You're going to... Uh fly your i'm sorry you tell the, what your plan is for the daring cap so my plan is to fly my motorcycle from panama city to colombia mm -hmm. because bikes can't be taken north to south anymore new legislation all of this um but i always wanted to connect the two continents not necessarily by land but just getting on a plane and looking out the window felt like cheating to me I know it's easier and the it's purists, like, the purists would agree with you. Yeah, yeah. so my plan is to uh, go to a little island called Kati Sugputu, which is northeastern coast of Panama. And this is like a tiny floating village about the size of a football field. And I'm planning to buy uh, a traditional dugout canoe called a dinghy. And then I'm going to paddle down the coast to Colombia. Are you going to dig it out yourself? I'm not going to dig it out myself. Oh, come on. I know, it's cheating. Right, it's fine. cheating. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, apparently I can buy one for between $1 and $300, depending on the condition. Okay. And it'll need a patch or two. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give it a name. Haven't decided yet. And then I'm going to, it should take about 12 days, I think, to paddle down the coast. Brilliant. That sounds like a blast. What an adventure. All right. Yeah. And then pick up your bike and continue, so to speak. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I want, what I do want to do now is go backwards a bit, and I want to, uh, you to tell everyone here uh, a brief version of your story um, off-road riding below Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. Uh, tell us what, what the route was, Yeah. who you were with, and the challenge it was, and I'm hopefully going to be putting up some photos showing it. Yeah, I guess um, I met a guy called Oscar. Uh, kind of a strange way to meet. I, I left the campsite in San Blas. I got a call an hour later from the guys at the campsite saying, you won't believe this, there's another guy on a motorcycle riding from Colombia to Argentina and he's just pulled up and camped in your spot. So these guys put me in touch with Oscar and it was really nice to ride with another rider because when you're solo you have a different risk profile, like th there's a whole different way you have to look at a trip. Uh, and I think Oscar kind of felt the same way. When we met up, um, I would describe us both as frothing for an adventure, one that we'd not been able to take on our own. Um, and we decided to take the road out to Yalapa, which is just south of Puerto Vallarta, which at the time was really bad. Um, so they do rebuild the road several times a year. Uh, in Canada and where you're from in the US, they're pretty good at putting in drainage. So these roads stay fixed when they're fixed and that, that doesn't happen in Yalapa. So there was some really deep mud. Uh, there was a river crossing, a proper river crossing. And uh, yeah, there was, there was a few obstacles to deal with there, which was really good fun. Did, so, it, did it meet your criteria, a high adventure? It did, did yeah. It? Okay. Yeah, I had so te a text from my parents about don't break a limb and stuff like that. So for me, that was a success. So, so at the end of the day, this was a road that is generally not taken or not used much and was in poor shape. And yeah. you did, did you see anyone else on the road? I believe the when the road has been refinished, right. um, it, is, it is a nice ride. Okay. But when we went, as you'll see from the pictures mm. now, maybe um yeah the road was you know it was it was 10 to 12 inch deep slick mud like this it right. was kind of sucking the bikes into the ground and uh, it was really good fun all right then so. you, you met your goal yeah and you're here talking about it i am so cheers <laughs> so with that what i like to do is ask uh, kind of a, a general question of um why 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 ride a motorcycle? Why even create challenge in, in the mud and with this road? Why be cold and hot and dirty on a motorcycle to travel around the world? Why have you chosen this? Why should someone do it? Uh, I guess there was a little bit of a moment for me, and I hope the, the people that are involved don't mind me talking about it, but um, my, my last partner, Nina, her dad got very sick. His name was Carol. And we went back to the UK to look after him and he was a great guy and he'd accomplished great things in his life. He started a, a Citroen C1 racing club, um, an endurance racing club. He ran several successful businesses from the home that he designed and built himself. Um, so the guy was, you know, he was an Englishman and he had his, his castle, if you like. And 
we, you know, he experienced a number of difficulties leading up to his death, um, which I won't go into, but I, I guess I sat and, and tried to figure out, you know, what would be difficult for me if I was to die. Um, we actually went down to his storage lockup and he kept a bunch of cool race cars and parts and stuff in there. And um, when we were down there, there was an RV and the RV was kitted out for like transcontinental travel. The guy's a proper, you know, he's gadgets galore. He'd done solo and he'd done heating. Everything was custom, everything was awesome. And I took a quick, quick check, you know, I was looking through the unit, just snooping around and it was sick. But on the way out, I noticed there was a little uh, piece of film on the thermostat on the screen. And I got this like shiver down my spine. And I realized that this RV had never been used, like a shiver down my spine. And uh, I guess at that point, uh, you know, I, I don't I'm not necessarily necessarily saying that you know Carol regretted not going on a trip for a lifetime in this RV, um, but I realised that if it was me, uh, if it was me, you know, if I was going to die tomorrow, that would be my biggest regret. And so I kind of decided to flip the tables and say, well, if that's your biggest regret, then maybe you should throw all of your resources at that. And that meant getting rid of my car, you know saying goodbye to my job and my possessions and all that kind of stuff and, and just being like, I have to hit the road now. That's fair. I mean, that's a story you hear over and over. Uh, the clock is uh, brutal and true Yeah. and no one stops it. No. Um, so you figured now's the time. Yeah. Um, and you are 33? Uh, next thir month, 32. 32, 33 next month. Perfect. Great age to do this, by the way. I think so. It's the meat of the curve, in my opinion. I think I'm right there. Yeah, I decided <laughs> if I'd done this when I was 22, I wouldn't have had like the the means or possibly the maturity to understand the trip and how it's going to benefit me in my life. Um, and at 33, I'm I feel like I'm right there. Like this is this is where I need to be. And when you're all done, you can go home and um, continue. Exactly. Whatever you're doing. All right. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap it up with that, Charlie, and cool. uh, we're going to wrap it up with one more cheers. Thank you very much for telling us your story. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Finn. Mm -hmm.